Welcome to Context. This is Brad Harris. Today we're considering the book The Wealth and Poverty of Nations Why Some Are So Rich and Some So Poor by the economic historian David Landes. The Wealth and Poverty of Nations was published in 1998, and it has occupied a preeminent place on the bookshelf of scholars ever since. Multiple reviewers, from the Nobel laureate Kenneth Arrow to Kirkus Reviews, have described this book as brilliant, and the author, David Landes, as one of the most compelling historians of the 20th century. He wrote a handful of other highly influential works as well, including Unbound Prometheus, published in 1969, which continues to be one of the most important books on the history of the Industrial Revolution. Along with Revolution in Time, which is among my favorite books on the history of timekeeping technology and time consciousness. David Landes died in 2013 at the age of 89 after spending nearly 50 years working as an economic historian at Harvard. In our last episode, we finished our analysis of the book Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond with a nagging question. How did European society, the most backward of all major Eurasian societies a thousand years ago, surpass everyone else to create the modern world? Jared Diamond helped us understand how Eurasians in general became so much more powerful than Native Americans, Aboriginal Australians, Pacific Islanders, and others. Eurasians won the environmental lottery. They had vastly greater natural resources with which to build vastly more powerful civilizations. Native Americans had llamas. Eurasians had horses, pigs, cows, goats, sheep, etc. No contest. But Diamond left us wondering why, among Eurasians, it wasn't the Chinese or the Abbasid Caliphate of Arabia that led the modern world. Both of these societies were far richer and far more technologically advanced than Europeans a thousand years ago. So, what was it that enabled Europeans to race past everyone else in wealth, power, and global influence in the centuries since? Why am I speaking English instead of Mandarin or Arabic? In The Wealth and Poverty of Nations, David Landes provides some answers. The question that motivates Landes' book is simple How did the rich countries get so rich? This is not just a historical curiosity, its answer has some major implications today. Just consider the migrant crisis currently unfolding across Europe. As Landis foresaw 20 years ago, it is in our own self interest in rich countries to understand how poor societies can become healthier and wealthier. Quote, if we do not, they will seek to take what they cannot make. And if they cannot earn by exporting commodities, they will export people. End quote. That resonates even more today than it did 20 years ago when this book came out. Now, there's a lot of political baggage associated with confronting the reality that the West is disproportionately rich and powerful. As we've already addressed on this podcast, for a really long time, many people lazily assumed that European power was the product of some kind of racial superiority. And so, in more recent generations, there's been a welcome corrective to that nonsense as scholars have shown how European dominance derived from things other than European biology or race or whatever other immutable characteristic. Jared Diamond's argument in Guns, Germs, and Steel was a great example. Superior environmental resources, not superior intelligence, he argued, enabled Eurasians to conquer the world. But Landis thinks many others carry this historical corrective too far when they reinterpret Western wealth and power as merely the products of ruthlessness, greed, colonialist exploitation, or some other terrible thing. I totally agree. This brand of lazy cynicism overlooks nearly as many historical variables as the crude racism it purports to counter. The history of European wealth and power is not merely a history of evil. It's far more inspiring than that. 
And thank goodness, for why else would we ever strive to help enrich and empower other societies if that were merely an exercise in propagating evil? To the contrary, what Landis impressively demonstrates through his 650-page book is that Europeans in general, and Northwest Europeans in particular, achieved unprecedented wealth and power in large part by cultivating a more curious, independent, and entrepreneurial culture than anyone else. Quote, If we learn anything from the history of economic development, it is that culture makes all the difference. End quote. Like any good historian, Landy spends a lot of time early on in his book acknowledging other factors that may have helped Europeans. He agrees with Diamond that environmental resources were favorable in Europe, citing the Gulf Stream, for example, as a, quote, good fortune that gives Western Europe warm winds, gentle rains, water in all seasons, and low rates of evaporation, the makings of good crops, big livestock, and dense hardwood forests, end quote. Nonetheless, he makes it clear that despite whatever lucky circumstance Europeans may or may not have enjoyed, we're still left with the historical conundrum that the probability a thousand years ago of European global domination was near zero, while only 500 years later, it was close to 100%. That shocking change in historical trajectory can't be adequately explained by environmental or other external factors alone, leaving something about Europeans themselves, the structure of their society and institutions, their relationship to authority, their ethics, their values, their outlook on life, as a more likely explanation for the process of European transcendence. Or so Landis argues, quote, To get an idea of the larger character of this process, one has to see the Middle Ages as a bridge between an ancient world set in the Mediterranean, Greece and then Rome, and a modern Europe north of the Alps and Pyrenees. In those middle years, a new society was born, very different from what had gone before, and took a path that set it decisively apart from other civilizations. End quote. What was so different about the new European society that grew up in the centuries after Rome's collapse? Well, to begin with, Landis illuminates Europe's unique embrace of the value of private property. After the Roman Empire disintegrated through the 400s AD, the sources of authority in Europe shifted. Some vestiges of Roman legal custom remained, but they were counterbalanced by a resurgence of Germanic tribal laws and enveloped within a new religious tradition, Judeo-Christianity. This new combination of social power structures, stewarded by the authority of Christianity, Landis argues, fostered the institutionalization of private property. Built into the rules of the new European culture was the Christian principle that God above, not man on earth, was the ultimate authority, the ultimate owner, as it were, of everything. This meant, as Landis put it, quote, earthly rulers were not free to do as they pleased, and even the church, God's surrogate on earth, could not flout rights and take at will, end quote. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's, right? At least in principle, Landis admits that in practice, European lords and kings and popes often did flout this Christian precept and undermine private property, seizing assets and people and doing all sorts of other tyrannical stuff. And yet... A second unique historical condition of emerging Europe restrained the reach of any particular ruler's tyranny, Europe's exceptional political fragmentation. Unlike China and the Islamic Caliphate, European political power was distributed through a patchwork of independent entities. This exceptional political fragmentation, Landis points out, gave rise to a kind of political competition between European municipalities that incentivized them to take better care of their subjects than rulers outside of Europe were inclined to do. 
Treat them badly, Landis wrote, and European merchants, mercenaries, craftsmen, philosophers, the bright minded makers and doers of society might go elsewhere. And here, the character of European cities was key. Quote, the contest for power in European societies also gave rise to the specifically European phenomenon of the semi autonomous city, organized and known as a commune. Cities were, of course, to be found around the world, but nothing like the commune appeared outside Western Europe. The essence of the commune lay first in its economic function. These units were governments of the merchants, by the merchants, and for the merchants. And second, its exceptional civil power, its ability to confer social status and political rights on its residents, rights crucial to the conduct of business and to freedom from outside interference, which made the cities gateways to freedom. End quote. The Catholic Church, based in Rome, may have been able to lord over some European cities, especially those in southern Europe, but the farther north and west you traveled, the more independent European cities tended to become. In China, no such oases of freedom existed. City and country dwellers alike were thoroughly supervised, regulated, and repressed by the ruling dynasty. And as for the Muslim world, it was practically impossible to avoid religious censure. In stark contrast, the unique autonomy of many European cities enabled, quote, areas of potentially free thought. This freedom found expression later on in the Protestant Reformation, but even before, Europe was spared the thought control that proved a curse in Islam. End quote. Relative to cities elsewhere, the spirit of economic and intellectual freedom of many European cities kindled a culture of curiosity, rebelliousness, creativity, entrepreneurship. In short, urban Europe gave rise to a culture that valued novelty. The historical consequences for European development of science, technology, art, and enterprise were massive. Consider technology. Although Europe initially lagged behind many other Eurasian societies, its culture of novelty drove Europeans not only to become exceptionally acquisitive of any foreign technology they could get their hands on, but also incentivized widespread technological tinkering at home, which together propelled European technology to surpass even China's by the year 1500. For example, China had made use of water wheels longer, but Europeans took the technology further. As early as the year 1100, there were nearly 6,000 water wheels generating power in England alone. Even more impressive, Landy's writes, were the unparalleled advancements Europeans achieved in the application of power technology. Quote, the invention or improvement of accessory devices, such as cranks and toothed gears, made it possible to use the power at a distance, change its direction, convert it from rotary to reciprocating motion, and apply it to an increasing variety of tasks. Hence, not only grinding grain, but pounding cloth, hammering metal, rolling and drawing sheet metal and wire, mashing hops for beer, pulping rags for paper. Europe, as nowhere else, became a power-based civilization. End quote. As important as power technology in particular certainly was, Europe's embrace of all kinds of technological novelty turned it into the most innovative society in the world through the Middle Ages. Landy's documents a litany of transformative technologies that greatly enhance the potential of European society, including eyeglasses, a deceptively powerful device invented in the late 1200s that more than doubled the productive careers of craftsmen, scribes, philosophers, weavers, and metalworkers. Mechanical clocks, also invented in the late 1200s, which revolutionized the economy, the cooperative capacity of society, and to the pursuit of scientific and technological precision. Printing, developed in the mid-1400s, which led to an explosion of new knowledge about the world and humanity's place within it. And gunpowder, imported from China around 1300, which revolutionized Europe's military power and even mining industries. 
The contrast with China and the Muslim world that Landis lays out is striking. Even during the so-called golden age of Islam between the 700s and 1300s, when Arabic philosophy and commerce thrived, Landis argues that the threat of religious denouncement remained universal, which stifled innovation and left medieval Muslim scientists more hesitant than their European counterparts to apply their insights, however impressive, to the development of new technology. Quote, for nearly 500 years, the world's greatest scientists wrote in Arabic. Yet, a flourishing science contributed nothing to the slow advance of technology in Islam. End quote. Even under the Abbasid Caliphate, Muslims rejected the printing press, fearing its potential to mass-produce heresy. In Landy's assessment, quote, nothing did more to cut Muslims off from the mainstream of knowledge. End quote. In China, meanwhile, technological development proceeded entirely at the whim of the ruling dynasty, which could, and often did, simply shut down various enterprises deemed too destabilizing. Perhaps the most historically intriguing such episode occurred under the Ming Dynasty after the 1430s, when China's massive maritime expeditions, which had carried Chinese sailors as far afield as the eastern shores of Africa, were unilaterally terminated. Quote, the decision was taken not only to cease from maritime exploration, but to erase the very memory of what had gone before, lest later generations be tempted to renew the folly. From 1436, requests for the assignment of new craftsmen to the shipyards were refused. By 1500, anyone who built a ship of more than two masts was liable to the death penalty. And in 1525, coastal authorities were enjoined to destroy all ocean-going ships and to arrest their owners. End quote. China may have been far more technologically advanced than Europe a thousand years ago, but their whimsical approach to technological development ultimately proved far less productive. They lacked any semblance of a free market or institutionalized property rights, and the Chinese state habitually undermined private enterprise, co-opting businesses, manipulating prices, and exacting bribes. All of this left little incentive for innovation and little room for private initiative altogether. The state simply monopolized everything, from commodities and construction to education, printing, and even music. As Landis puts it, quote, It was a regime of endless paperwork and endless harassment. The ingenuity and inventiveness of the Chinese, which had given so much to mankind, would no doubt have enriched China further and probably brought it to the threshold of modern industry had it not been for this stifling state control. End quote. That kind of totalitarianism, so vulnerable to the regressive impulses of emperors, was impossible in politically fragmented Europe. So while China was outlawing overseas trade and co-opting or prohibiting innovation altogether, European urbanites beyond the reach of repressive rulers were growing intoxicated with the prospects of progress and profit. After the 1400s, Europe positively frothed with rebellious intrigue and revelatory excitement. Religious heresies abounded, and casualties became martyrs, inspiring even more widespread dissent. Banned books became even more popular, and all the while the lure of oceanic and scientific discovery was igniting the curiosity of entire generations. While Chinese rulers enforced isolationism and reverence for collective stability, Europeans were enshrining novelty as a virtue in and of itself. While China assumed its celestial glory was timeless, the Judeo-Christian sense of linear time, combined with Europe's deployment of mechanical clocks, focused Europe's attention on measurable progress through economies of input and output. 
Even when they had briefly ventured upon the seas, the Chinese lacked the curiosity that would later drive Europeans around the globe. As Landis writes, the Chinese had sailed through the Indian Ocean, quote, to show themselves, not to see and learn, to bestow their presence, not to stay, to receive obeisance and tribute, not to buy, end quote. And once they closed the maritime door for good after 1500, quote, isolationism became China, round, complete, apparently serene, ineffably harmonious. The celestial empire purred along for hundreds of years more, impervious and imperturbable, but the world was passing it by, end quote. Within Europe itself, moreover, countries to the north and west began passing by those of the south and east, often for similar reasons. Portugal, for example, succeeded in becoming one of the richest, most advanced states in Europe through the 1400s and 1500s by virtue of its early and aggressive development of maritime trade. Thrust out into the Atlantic on its perch at the edge of the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal beheld the prospect of dominating half a world's worth of oceanic commerce, only to retreat from the disruption of foreign influence. Merchants be damned. Catholic authorities cracked down swiftly on deviant thought and destabilizing enterprise alike. The Catholic Inquisition was fired up after the 1540s, sending not only international merchants, but Jews and all manner of skeptical scholars fleeing the country in droves. Quote, They took with them money, commercial know-how, connections, knowledge, and, even more serious, those immeasurable qualities of curiosity and dissent that are the leaven of thought. By 1513, Portugal wanted for astronomers. By the 1520s, scientific leadership was gone. End quote. As in China, the powers that be in Portugal valued isolationism over cosmopolitanism, stability over opportunity. And as in China, they were able to enforce their regressive will within their country's borders. Landis contrasts Portugal with the Netherlands, Same population around the year 1500, about a million people, but on a very different cultural trajectory. Half of the Dutch lived in cities, a greater percentage than anywhere else in Europe, and their own proximity to the sea fixed the Dutch gaze outward rather than inward and fostered a frenzy of port construction and maritime ventures. Quote, By the 1560s, the province of Holland alone possessed some 1,800 seagoing ships, six times those floated by Venice at the height of its prosperity a century earlier. About 500 of these were attached to Amsterdam, but in fact the whole seaboard was a pincushion of masts. End quote. Ultimately, a cultural chasm opened up within Europe after the Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s, tilting Europe's commercial, scientific, and technological center of gravity away from Catholic strongholds in the south and east and toward Protestant territories in the north and west. In 1905, the German sociologist and economist Max Weber published a highly influential thesis about the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, arguing that it was the prevalence of Protestantism in Northern Europe that encouraged a historically exceptional work ethic, secular engagement, and industrial enterprise among the Dutch, French, and especially the English, sowing the seeds of the Industrial Revolution and the rise of modern capitalism capitalism itself. Weber's infamous thesis has fallen out of fashion among most historians who've come to consider it too speculative and simplistic, but Landis disagrees. Quote, Records show that Protestant merchants and manufacturers played a leading role in trade, banking, and industry. In manufacturing centers in France and western Germany, Protestants were typically the employers, Catholics the employed. In Switzerland, the Protestant cantons were the centers of export and manufacturing for watches, machinery, and textiles, whereas the Catholic ones were primarily agricultural. 
In England, the most devout Protestants, the Calvinists, were disproportionately active and influential in the factories and forges of the nascent Industrial Revolution. The heart of the matter lay indeed in the making of a new kind of man, rational, ordered, diligent, productive. These virtues, while not new, were hardly commonplace. Protestantism generalized them among its adherents, who judged one another by conformity to these standards. End quote. What's more, Landis goes on to demonstrate higher literacy rates among Protestants compared with Catholics in the centuries leading up to and through the Industrial Revolution, along with much higher rates of mechanical clock ownership among Protestants, indicative of greater sensitivity to opportunity cost and measurement of productivity. Although Landis stresses that Protestantism was not the only factor in propelling Northwestern Europeans ahead of their Southeastern counterparts, within his overall argument for the cultural causes of European society's rise to power, Weber's thesis plays an important role. After reading hundreds of pages of Landy's comparative cultural analysis, the origin of the Industrial Revolution— Late 1700s Britain seems historically logical. The autonomy of intellectual inquiry, the openness, the appetite even for foreign insight, and especially the incentives for private enterprise were greater in Britain than anywhere else. The Brits weren't any smarter than the Chinese, the Muslims, the Portuguese, or the Spanish— They were just more motivated and more open to good ideas wherever they might come from. James Watt's steam engine of 1775 drew on an exceptionally cosmopolitan heritage of scientific inquiry into the nature of vacuums and air pressure that stretched from the work of Otto von Gehrig in Germany and Evangelista Torricelli in Italy to Robert Boyle in England and Dennis Papin in France and his ability to patent and personally profit from his invention within the legal framework of Britain was unparalleled. Personal success among the English was prestigious, a cause for admiration, not scorn as in so many other countries. I gotta quote Landy's at length here, quote, That was why it became so important to show and tell, often in elegant salons. These ladies and gentlemen were witnesses to achievement. And that was why scientists were so keen to found journals and get articles published, to replicate experiments, verify results, correct, improve, go beyond. The Britain of the Industrial Revolution had preserved the structures and institutions of an older time, the monarchy, the guilds, the ceremonies, ceremonies, the costumes, but had sidetracked these and reduced them to vanities. They gave us the nostalgic world of Jane Austen, a world of rural gentility and idleness, quietly lying in wait to draw the tired and incapable and handsome seekers of social rent into the nirvana of triviality. But the action was elsewhere, with new men, aristocrats turned entrepreneurs, immigrants from within and without. Compare the late industrial development of Italy, Spain, and Portugal— All of these were hurt by religious and intellectual intolerance. Iberia particularly wanted for enterprise and skills, including the ability to read. These failings went back centuries to religious zealotry and counter-reformation cultivation of ignorance. Around 1900, for example, when only 3% of the population of Great Britain was illiterate, the figure for Italy was 48%. For Spain, 56%. For Portugal, 78%. The religious persecutions of old, the massacres, hunts, expulsions, forced conversions, and self-imposed intellectual closure proved to be a kind of original sin. Their effects would not wear off until the 20th century, and not always even then. End quote. The lesson for other countries, of course, was that British educational and legal institutions, if not British commerce and cultural values, might be replicated in order to replicate Britain's enrichment. 
The French did this, establishing one of the best engineering universities in the world in 1794, the École Polytechnique. Uniting scientific theory with technological practice in lavishly state-supported engineering universities like this enabled France to leapfrog over Britain industrially through the first half of the 1800s. Germany followed suit a generation later, establishing the world's first industrial research laboratories that attracted the best students of chemistry from as far away as America. Another generation and Japan was jockeying into competitive commercial and industrial position after deciding that, since they couldn't beat Western powers, they might as well try joining them. The last of the Tokugawa shogunate forced Japan to break free of its long cultural isolationism and absorb as much intellectual property from the West as possible. The Wealth and Poverty of Nations offers a vast and bold interpretation of the historical patterns of power. David Landes, a decorated veteran of academic argument, whose long and influential career essentially culminated with the publication of this book, concludes his narrative by anticipating criticisms of Eurocentrism. Quote, Today, the very account of this story is seen by some as an aggression. In a world of relativistic values and moral equality, the very idea of a West-centered global history is denounced as arrogant and depressive. End quote. What too many academics would prefer instead, Landis asserts, is an egalitarian history that says something good about every culture and frames the European contribution to modernity as more of an accident of history than a product of unique values or institutions. Thus, Landis concludes, quote, the manifest asymmetry between Europe's systematic curiosity about foreign civilizations and cultures and the relative indifference of these others is denied as though history hadn't happened, end quote. But Europe in general, and Northwest Europe in particular, was home to a historically unique culture— unique in its curiosity about the world and other people's insights, unique in its respect for private property and enterprise, unique in its pursuit of scientific and technological progress, unique in its fascination with novelty. And we should want to learn about that, Landis argues. We should remain curious about what made Northwest Europe so rich and powerful, rather than deny the historical fact or dismiss it as little more than the product of industrially powered greed. Landis convincingly shows us that there was far more to it than that, and far more that we can learn from that history. Most societies that have confronted the turbulence of change have turned away in fear, closing themselves off from the possibilities of progress for the sake of stability. Through the wealth and poverty of nations, Landis reminds us that Northwest Europe grew rich, at least in part, by trying to absorb the best ideas and the best people, not just the best material wealth that the world had to offer. Yes, there was brutality, there was exploitation, there was greed, but that's not all there was. And Northwest Europe never had a monopoly on evil. What they did monopolize for a time, on the other hand, was openness, respect for personal success and social mobility, and the exhilaration of intellectual, spiritual, and commercial freedom. And that is the historical lesson. I think there's more gold down the intellectual mine shaft of this historical lesson. These days, it seems like many intellectuals are more apt to blame Britain for developing capitalism than credit it with offering the most productive idea in history. More specifically, Britain pulled something off a few centuries ago that continues to make all of our lives better. They made the pursuit of knowledge profitable. As the historian Margaret Jacob writes, Britain, quote, integrated science with worldly concerns, focusing mainly on the entrepreneurs and engineers who possessed scientific insight and who were eager to profit from its advantages, end quote. 
If there were ever a cultural value we should respect, it is the cultural value of science. Next time, here on Context, we'll consider Jacob's book on the subject, titled Scientific Culture and the Making of the Industrial West. I'm Brad Harris. So long. <laughs>